faithfulness. And uh, we're going to be picking up, of course, today in the book of James, where we have been for the last couple of weeks. And we have one more week after this one in the book of James. Let's take a moment and commit this uh, time together to the Lord as for his direction. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for another wonderful day to come together with your people, to worship you, to seek your face, to study your word. We do pray that you would give us clarity of thought today and the leading of your Holy Spirit. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to be doing today is starting, of course, where we left off uh, last time. Specifically, we're going to be starting off in the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 7. Uh, I wanted to, to do this, and we, of course, we're, we ended last week with basically with this same verse. But I wanted to do this because this will enable us to speak for a while today about uh, baptism, water baptism name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and that is one of our fundamental beliefs in this church usually when we are talking about this we kind of start off with Acts 2:38, and there's nothing wrong with doing that at all in fact we'll probably look at that verse today um, and then we have some other favorite verses uh, in Acts chapter 8 Acts chapter 10 Acts chapter 19 and, and some of the verses from the epistles as well about uh, water baptism and specifically baptism in the name of Jesus. We don't often notice and pay a lot of attention to how the book of James addresses this issue. And so we're going to spend some time on that today. Uh, specifically, we noticed when we first started this series of lessons how the book of James chapter 1 and verse 1 testifies to the deity of Jesus Christ. And I'm using the New King James translation here today, but uh, specifically that verse tells us James, a slave or a bondservant of uh, the Lord and God, Jesus Christ. Or it could be translated the Lord God or uh, something like that. But uh, particularly speak, uh, speaks to the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Yes. And I just want us to notice that. But then we come down to chapter 2, which we've spent some time with, and verse 1, which essentially tells us, again, something about the deity of Christ, but specifically uh, that he is the glory, picking up from the Old Testament theme of the glory of God. Uh, sometimes we say that we're talking about a theophany there, uh, a visible manifestation of the invisible God. But now we notice in chapter 2, where we're picking up, and I'm going to go ahead and start reading it in James chapter 2 and verse 1 and just read down through verse 7. And then we'll make some comments about that. Uh, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you notice if you're reading the King James or the New King James as I am now, you notice the words the Lord there are in italics, which of course tells us that um, those words are supplied by the translators. They're not actually in the Greek text. But we go right to the idea, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory, and identifying Jesus as the very glory of God, or the visible manifestation of God. And so, uh, and it goes on then to say that you should not have this faith with partiality. And we could just spend the entire time here today talking about the need not to be prejudiced or partial in any sense. But what I'm emphasizing is that Jesus Christ is the very glory of God. And then verse 2, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings, in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes. So he set up here a pretty clear idea of showing partiality to the rich and those who are well-dressed and so forth. Uh, verse 3, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there. Uh, 
or sit here at my footstool? Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? And then right here, verse 7, we want to focus. Do they not blaspheme or speak evil of? Do they not blaspheme or speak evil of that noble name by which ye are called? Okay. So as we concluded last week, we asked the question, uh, what is uh, that noble name? And when were they called by this noble name? So that's where we're focusing uh, right now. And I want to express my appreciations to the folks uh, in the production team. They're helping me today so I don't get all fouled up with my automatic, not automatic, but attempts to look automatic in advancing these slides. So they're, they're doing this for me and I appreciate that so much. So what is this noble name by which the readers were called? And when were they called by that name? So what we've got here is uh, something going on to illustrate the importance of a name. A name that's a noble name. And a name by which they have been called. We could just overlook this and say, well, that's an interesting verse, and uh, it's nice that there's some good names to be called by. But we're, talk we're talking about something very specific here, as, as the Greek text indicates. Uh, and so if we could advance that slide. Um, there's several scholars that I've called together in my research uh, on the book of James recently. Um, that I'm not going to bother to give you all of their names. You can see some of them on the slide. And uh, I have uh, mentioned specifically some of them earlier in our studies. But um, what I'm working with here is I'm working from a manuscript that I wrote uh, some time ago that Brother Brickle mentioned to me uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, that they're getting this into book form to... Uh, to put together a volume on early Christian uh, Christo early Christology. In other words, how did the first century Christians think about Jesus? What did they believe about him? And we can see that when we read these early books, and especially the book of James, since as I've mentioned several times, is probably the first epistle to be written in the New Testament, probably about 47 or 48 AD. So, it's like we're reading the mail here of somebody, a uh, letter that was written uh, a couple thousand years ago, and we're discovering how they were thinking about Jesus Christ. And we already have seen in the book of James that they believed he was God. He was the Lord God, that he was the very glory of God, manifested uh, in a visible form. But now, uh, after reading a few more verses this morning, we see that there's a connection going on here about the idea of name. And that idea is that there is uh, a noble name that was called over them. Now, I want to just tell you right, right up front, I'm just going to be honest about this and not spend a lot of time trying to prove it, but that we're going to discover that that noble name is Jesus. Yes. And we're going to discover that that noble name was called over them at the point of their baptism. So we don't often notice this in James uh, because the word baptism does not appear there. We just kind of skip over that. But we're not going to skip over it today. And I'm quoting here from a scholar who, who has pointed out that the concept of the name of God lies at the center of the Bible. And this is obviously and evidently true as we read through the scriptures. There's a great emphasis on the name of God. We all know the story of uh, Moses and asking God, well, who should I say sent me? Exodus chapter 3. And God telling him, uh, I am. Uh, you can 
tell them that I am sent you. And so, um, but we see this thread throughout scripture. So we have this concept of name. Now, for you and me, unless we study the culture of the use of name in scripture, we just think of a name as a label. You know, my name is Daniel, which by the way is a good Bible name. Uh, I have a whole book in the Bible that's uh, well, not really named after me, but I'm named after this guy in the Bible whose name means, Daniel means, God is my judge. And uh, I like to point out when I say anything about that, that just in case, in case I should forget that, I actually have in my Bible right here, it says Daniel. And the name, uh, my name means, God is my judge. And so I carry that around because it keeps me sober. I mean, I have to remember, God is my judge. And so I want to be sure uh, to kind of be, you know, ready to stand before you. Uh, but your name means something too. Whatever your name is, it has a meaning. Unless it's just made up from something. But... But essentially, many of us have Bible names or some form of a Bible name. Because in Scripture, you have people who bear names that often have something to do with their character or with their destiny or with their purpose and calling. And so uh, it's useful to think about um, if we're having a child, okay, what should we name this baby? And uh, we get that from scripture. I have a couple of books in, uh, in my library that give uh, suggested names, you know, for babies. You, you've not sure seen those at some point in your life. And, and usually there'll be a little definition there that kind of helps you know what the meaning of the name is. Uh, for example, I have a daughter named Sharon. And I, when, I, when uh, my wife and I had her, um, we didn't really think about what we were going to name her until she came. And uh, she arrived, and we could just tell by looking at her that her name was Sharon, and that means princess. So that's not a bad name to have. It's actually based on a Hebrew word. Um, I have a son who is named Mark. He has a whole book in the Bible named after him, too. And, um, but, but we didn't think about in advance what are we going to name him? Because in our in our culture, we don't really think about the significance of names. Uh, but as you as life goes by, sometimes uh, you get to wondering, well, what does my name mean? Well, you can find that out uh, today. Of course, I'm sure you can just Google it, put your name in there, and it's going to come up and tell you what it means. Well, there is a divine name that has great meaning. And so much of it is built upon the I am concept of the Old Testament, which comes in even into the New Testament as far as the, the meaning of that is concerned. It comes into the New Testament in the name of Jesus, which specifically uh, comes from the idea of he will save, uh, meaning the I am will save. But uh, as we keep reading what I've got here for you on the, on the screen, there is a real sense in which the Bible is poised upon the revelation of the divine name. Distinctively, the New Testament associates baptism with the name. And by the way, the scholar that I'm reading after right here is, is not a oneness Pentecostal. You may think that only we oneness Pentecostals have ever noticed anything about this. But many scholars of scripture, and especially if, if they know something about the original languages, many of them recognize that baptism is to be done in the name of Jesus Christ. And they don't mind saying so. And we're reading here after uh, one of these scholars who says, um, this is young blood now, he observes that in the ancient world, a name was not merely a label, but it was virtually the equivalent of whoever or whatever bore it. In other words, as strange as it may sound, the name and the person are equivalent because of the meaning of the name. 
And uh, the name and the being of God are often used in parallelism with each other, stressing their essential identity. Here's an amazing thing. Belief in Jesus' name is the same as believing in Jesus himself. We have a scripture for that. It's John chapter 3 and verse 18. Let's read that. We all know John 3, 16. Uh, let's take a look at the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 3. And verse 18. And uh, John 3 and 18 reads, He who believes in him, meaning Jesus Christ, uh, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So in this one verse, we have the idea of believing in him. And in the same verse, the idea of believing in his name. To believe in Jesus is to believe in his name and to believe in his name is to believe in him. This shows the very close connection between uh, the idea of identity and naming. In the scriptures, these things uh, go together. So let's go on to, uh, as I will just skip past the names of those scholars there. Let's go on uh, to this line. Uh, in Scares of You, James chapter 2 and verse 7, could very well be an allusion to baptism. According to Acts, baptism was carried out in the name of Jesus. Right. And the baptized Christians bore his name, the name of Jesus by which these early Christians were called through baptism, remained their permanent possession through faith. So again, here's a scholar, just a, a scholar of scripture, who points out from James 2 and 7 that we're talking here about baptism in the name of Jesus. Okay, and let's go on to uh, the, the next slide. Same scholar here. Scare refer references Adamson who notes that the idea of a name being called upon someone is common in the Septuagint. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And here implies Christian profession. Matthew 10, 22, uh, and Mark 13, 13, Acts 9, 16. We love to go to that text. Possibly with reference to a baptismal formula. Right. As in Acts chapter 8 and verse 16. These are some, some verses we don't always look at. Let's think about this for a moment. First of all, what does it mean, LXX? Well, whenever you see an LXX in uh, reading any work about Scripture, uh, that stands for the Septuagint. Uh, it, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek, which was commonly read in the first century. And when you look in the Septuagint, there is uh, a pattern there of the whole concept of a name being called upon someone. And that's what James is talking about here in James 2 and 7, a noble name that was called upon the believers at a specific point in time. And all that that I'm saying is because of the Greek form, the Greek grammar that appears right here. There's a noble name, it's a name that you have been called by, okay? And so um, we could take a look at these various texts, but I'm going to move on uh, right now. If you read those verses, Matthew 10, 22, Mark 13, 13, Acts 9, 16, You'll see something about this idea of possibly even there a baptismal formula in view. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, and uh, there's a, an early Christian writing, probably in, uh, there's a debate about whether this particular book was written. Some, I think the most common view is around 150 A.D., a work called The Shepherd of Hermits. And we're not talking here about a scriptural book. It's just a Christian book that was written at that point in time, commenting on life among Christians in the earliest years. And in The Shepherd of Hermits, there is a reference to the name of Jesus. 
that is mentioned in the baptism of Christians. Uh, so again, this is a post-biblical book, but just like the Bible itself, when it talks about baptism, it connects that with being baptized in the name of Jesus. It was what they were practicing in the earliest uh, years of the Christian life. Uh, don't worry about the little pictures there. Uh, just some early drawings of a, of a copy of the shepherd and Hermes. And so here's yet another testimony to this idea of being baptized in the name of Jesus. And uh, let's move along here to the next slide. A scholar by the name of Laws, who points out that James quoted, and I'm just fascinated by this. James quoted in Amos, uh, quoted Amos chapter 9 and verse 19 in Acts 15 and 17. Now, Acts 15 is the earliest church council, but it was, the outcome of it was an inspired outcome. In other words, we're not talking here about Nicaea in 325 or other councils that came along later. We're talking about the first council in the church, even while the New Testament was in the process of being written. And this church council meant specifically to debate the issue, what are we going to do about these Gentiles who are coming into the church? Do they still have to keep the law of Moses? And of course, for the earliest Jewish believers, I mean, their life was the law of Moses. And they believed in, in those scriptures. They knew those scriptures. And uh, on the day of Pentecost, you know, it was largely the Jewish believers who had gathered together their Jewish, Jewish people uh, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that day. There's some uh, proselytes, Gentiles who had converted to Judaism before that point in time. We were there. It tells us that in Acts chapter 2. Um, but for them to think about, okay, now the Gentiles are going to become part of what we are, that was a shocking thing for them. And um, it's not that they weren't willing to have anything to do with Gentiles. They were willing to do that if the Gentiles would convert or become proselytes. But uh, that was the big question. Do the Gentiles have to do that? Do they have to keep the law of Moses? And there was such debate about it that uh, there was a large gathering of believers there in Acts chapter 15 to talk about these things. Some of these uh, apostles who gathered there, Paul and Peter and so forth, uh, and others uh, had were of different opinions. And so they had to talk it over. And so uh, the apostles uh, who were in favor, it was, it was almost kind of a political thing, you know, okay, this side and that side. Some, some believe that the uh, Gentiles did have to convert uh, and, and to Judaism and keep the law of Moses and so forth. And others said, no, no, no. Like, uh, we've been seeing the Holy Spirit poured out on these Gentiles without going through all of that. And we don't think that's uh, necessary. They talked it over, Peter and Paul and others who were there on that day, and they finally came to a conclusion, and that conclusion was, no, the Gentiles do not have to keep the law of Moses. God has already been pouring out his spirit upon them. Without them doing that, let's not put on them, as, as was said there, some heavy burden that even we couldn't bear, and insist that they also uh, keep those things. Um, Finally, James uh, wrote a letter and said, it seems good to the Holy Ghost and to us not to put upon them any heavier burden than, uh, than necessary. So, uh, just like Peter on the day of Pentecost had scriptures to quote to explain what was going on uh, with the outpouring of the Spirit. And Peter quoted from uh, Joel, we all know that, that was the very first thing he did. But he also quoted from Psalms, quoted a number of scriptures actually from Psalms, uh, to explain what was going on. But this was all from the book of Joel, one of what we call the minor prophets. Uh, I do not recommend 
when you get to heaven and meet Joel that you say, oh, you're just a minor prophet. I'm going to go over here and find Isaiah or somebody. Don't do that. Because it doesn't have to do with the importance of their message. It just kind of has to do with the length of their books. But anyway, um, so Peter, on Pentecost, he finds scripture to explain what is happening there from the book of Joel. Well, now, in Acts chapter uh, 15, we have the church meeting again, a major meeting, and trying to figure out God's direction for them about the Gentiles. And so after they hear the testimonies of the apostles and so forth, James now, not Peter, Peter was there, but James now is going to find scripture for the explanation of what God is doing among the Gentiles. And what fascinates me about it is whereas Peter quoted from Joel, uh, James quotes from the very next book in the Old Testament, the book of Amos. Both of them find Old Testament support for what God is doing in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so we have both Joel and Amos, two books that are back to back in the Old Testament, called into service to explain the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. First of all, on Pentecost, and then secondly, uh, these other events that happened after that, but that involved the Gentiles. And so this was, uh, again, let me read this text, Amos chapter 9 and verse 19. Uh, so here's what James read. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. That's an Old Testament text. Says the Lord who does all these things. And so, uh, isn't it just fascinating? We can skip around in the Old Testament different places, but to me it's just awesome that these two books that are joined in the Old Testament are, have such a high profile even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, specifically Acts 2 and Acts 15. And uh, then let's, okay, the next slide. Um, Laws notes that those who read James thought of themselves as bearing the name of Jesus. And it's probably this to which James alludes. That's in uh, Acts 2 and 7. The point at which they took on this role was baptism, which is frequently defined as baptism in or into the name of Jesus. And it would, you know, we're reading here about these events in the book of James. We're not reading right now from the book of Acts, but just like in the book of Acts or elsewhere in scriptures, the emphasis is on the name and specifically on being baptized and specifically being baptized in the name of Jesus. It's a consistent pattern that we see uh, in the, in the uh, New Testament. And just in case, Anybody says, well, I've never heard of that before. Let's take just a moment and look at a few of these verses. First of all, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, probably most of you could quote it. But if you look at Acts at 2 and, and 38, you'll read these words. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. And that would include Gentiles. All who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. That's Acts 2, 38 and 39. And if you, I don't know if you, if you have a Bible there that you can just kind of glance at, I'm looking at my open Bible here, and uh, I do recommend this to you if, if you don't have a Bible that in some way sets apart quotations from the Old Testament it, when they're used in the New Testament. Uh, for example, what mine does is every time it's quoted from the Old Testament is 
it uh, italicizes and sort of indents those quotations. So you can see instantly how many quotations there are. I recommend you get a Bible that does that because a lot of folks don't realize the powerful connection between the Old and New Testament because they don't just see when they look at a page anything that distinguishes those Old Testament quotations. Uh, when I look at, for example, at these two pages right here, this is, I can see Acts 2 and a little bit of Acts 3. Uh, I see all of these uh, indentations and uh, uh, italicized words. I counted them once. I think Peter quoted, uh, in 22 verses of Peter's message, are quotations from the Old Testament. Or if not quotations, at least allusions to the Old Testament. 22 verses. Those pre preachers back in those days, they didn't necessarily start their sermons like we do today with the Job or something. I mean, they, they started by quoting from the Old Testament. And they just kept quoting from the Old Testament until they were done. Because uh, the Old Testament is quoted from or alluded to or paraphrased about 800 times in the New Testament. So it would be a good idea to be familiar with with the, how the Old Testament is used by the New Testament writers. Okay, so I just read from Acts chapter 2, verses 38, and I added verse 39. Uh, if you look at Acts chapter 10, and verse uh, 48, Acts chapter 10, verse 48, this is uh, when the Holy Spirit is poured out uh, under Peter's ministry at the household of Cornelius. I'm gonna, I can't resist this temptation here. This is, uh, this is Acts chapter 10 and starting at verse 44. Because Peter, again, has been speaking to these Gentiles at, at Cornelius' house. And uh, the Bible says, beginning in verse 44 of Acts chapter 10, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed. Now these are Jewish people who were believers in Jesus. And they had been filled with the Spirit already. Those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter. Now, by the way, they were about, he brought about half a dozen Jewish believers with him to Cornelius' house. Probably kind of for protection. <laughs> you know, he, he felt like I'm going to need somebody to, to sort of store us and help me here with the situation. Uh, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know that? Well, the next verse tells us, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And so, so far, things that are going on are very much like what happened on the day of Pentecost. Okay. Then Peter answered, and I love this because that, to me it shows us something about Peter's personality. He had a very interesting personality. Of course, Paul had his own personality too. And uh, you look at these fellows, you know, again, they're just human beings like we are. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, but... You know, there comes a point in time when Paul calls Peter a hypocrite. And uh, that's the book of Galatians. Uh, and you just have to, that, those were interesting days. Sometimes we think today that we ought to just all be so peaceful in our relationships with each other that there would never be any tension at all. Well, that's not the way it is. We are all human beings. We have a lot of opinions about things. But Peter, after the Spirit is poured out among these Gentiles at Cornelius' house, he says, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized to have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Now, because we already kind of know what this is all about, the way we immediately look at that verse is that Peter is wanting to make it clear these Gentiles need to be baptized. And maybe that was the point, but I kind of think that Peter is, he's saying, can somebody help me here? 
And we think of some reason not to baptize these people. I mean, I mean they're not, they're Gentiles. Uh, so he says, can anyone forbid water? Well, nobody could. I mean, nobody could think of a reason not to baptize them. And so, verse 48 says, and he commanded them to be baptized. Notice, commanded. He didn't just suggest it, but he, said, he commanded them to be baptized. In the name of the Lord, and by the way, in the older Greek manuscripts, they read, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Isn't that great? Would you mind to stay a few days, Peter? But uh, they baptized these Gentiles. They received, received the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. That's a recapitulation of the experience that happened on the day of Pentecost. And then, if you wanted to take a look at, let's see, Acts chapter 19. Let's turn over there. Acts 19. And we'll read a couple of verses here. I'll start reading at uh, Acts 19 at verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, and they turned out to be disciples of John the Baptist, but finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now you can see right away that Paul expected if they had been believers on Jesus, they should have received the Holy Spirit. Did you receive the Spirit when you believed? And they said, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now it wasn't that they were unaware of the Holy Spirit. You can read about the Holy Spirit all the way through the Old Testament. In fact, uh, I think my latest book, Brother Johnson, I think, is titled The Holy Spirit. And it's about 300 and some odd pages long. And my goal in writing that book was to deal with every reference to the Holy Spirit in the entire Bible. Essentially, that's what I did, starting with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. <laughs> that's the first mention of the Spirit. The last bit, uh, mention of the Holy Spirit is in the last chapter of the book of Revelation, about six verses from the end of that chapter. 300 and some odd references to the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And uh, and so these, these disciples of John the Baptist certainly had heard about the Spirit of God, but they didn't realize that this promise had been fulfilled yet. They knew that John the Baptist was talking about it and so forth, but they hadn't yet experienced it. And so uh, verse 3, uh, Paul says to them, into what then were you baptized? So he recognized right away if they had been baptized in the name of Jesus, they would have received the Holy Spirit. That was the common experience. But these fellows had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So he questioned their baptism then. And they said, into John's baptism. That's how we were baptized. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And guess what happened to them after that baptism? Well, the next verse, Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, by the way, notice that this speaking in tongues and prophesying happened in a package, so to speak. And it happened as soon as they had been baptized in the name of Christ Jesus. In other words, they didn't have to wait until the next day or the next week or a year from then after receiving the Spirit before they were capable of prophesying. And really that makes a lot of sense when you look at, uh, at what Joel has to say about this and how Peter quoted it on the day of Pentecost. 
because the Holy Spirit would come upon uh, all flesh, male and female, young and old, and they will uh, receive the Spirit and they will prophesy. We tend to think about uh, prophecy, you know, only in terms of it's one of the spiritual gifts, or Romans chapter 12, and so forth. And that's okay. But just notice, you don't have to be a certain age or have a certain level of experience to be used of God in spiritual gifts. These are gifts. They're not something you work for or deserve or learn or whatever. They're just gifts. And there's not a reason in the world uh, that the Holy Spirit could not move here today in this place for someone to be baptized with the Spirit. You know that. You believe that. We, we see that. But in the will of God, that same person who receives the Holy Spirit today and speaks in tongues for the first time could also be prophesying before they get out the door. It's a matter of openness to the moving and working of the Spirit of God. And so everywhere we look, we see this, this same pattern going on, uh, even uh, in the book of James. These references to this noble name that was called over you. And, uh, and this being water baptism and uh, the moving of the Spirit on these people uh, in the book of James. We could go ahead and read other verses, but my watch is telling me, uh, don't get carried away. So uh, what we're going to do is go to the next slide and I'm going to summarize some things here. Uh, I'm just going to go to the summary so far. And this summary so far is going to summarize what we have seen so far in our study in this class and then next week we'll come back and go a bit farther. But uh, let's take a, uh, take a look at what we have seen so far in the book of James. We have the early identification of Jesus Christ as both Lord and God. James 1. one. And this is reiterated in his description of Jesus as the glory. James 2 and 1. The visible manifestation of the invisible God Hebrew scriptures, now visibly incarnate in human existence. And of course we see that in John chapter 1 and 1 Timothy 3.16 as well. Uh, the next slide please. We have seen the reference to a specific name that had been called over those who read this letter uh, and it, that is contextually and canonically informed to be Jesus. And perhaps even the full name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Next slide, please. Uh, we have seen the, the, the commendation for these believers because they believed in one God. It's an allusion to the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 4, uh, a reference to the same singular God introduced in the first verse of the letter. Identified as the glory made visible in the second chapter of the letter and whose name had been called over them at a specific point in time. So he's God. He's the glory of God. Uh, his name had been called over them at a point in time. But not just a general. It's not just saying you're Christians. By the way, the word Christian appears in the New Testament, I think, is three times. It may be surprising to you, and I probably shouldn't say this at the end of this lesson. But if you look at the context of all three of these occasions, they are all negative. It's, it's what somebody else was saying about them, not what they were, not a name that they picked up for themselves. Uh, it's kind of like uh, there's a group in the book of Acts referred to as the Herodians, because they were the people who followed and were, it literally means of the party of Herod. And uh, that same form of a word is, is used on the Christians to say, well, they're the Christ party. It wasn't just that they thought this would be a neat name. It was just, that's who they are. They follow around after him. Uh, not that the word Christian is a bad word. It's a wonderful word, of course. We're happy, thrilled to, to pick it up. But 
Notice that when we're talking about the name, the name is Jesus, Jesus Christ. Uh, and then I think we have our final slide here. And uh, it reads, there can be no idea in the book of James of excluding Jesus from the identification of God as one. I mean, the Shema is used, referred to in this book. Uh, and then, nor can there be any introduction here of a notion that God is somehow more than one. The Hebrew word that is translated one, echad, in Hebrews, uh, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, just literally is the number one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Nothing there about plurality, plurality, I can say that this morning. Uh, nothing there about, it's a compound word or whatever, no, it's just the symbol. There are other words that could be used if we were talking about a compound uh, word or some kind. But not here, not in Deuteronomy 6, 4. It just means one. And in the New Testament, it is revealed and shown that Jesus is that one God. We are baptized in his name. We are filled with his spirit. We are kin to these first century Christians to whom the book of James was written. Well, thank you for pay paying such good attention here today. I just am very happy about that. And I'm glad that you came to study the word of the Lord. Let's stand and uh, we'll say a word of prayer. And then we have some time for a further prayer as we go beyond this point in time today. Thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. And thank you for the word of God that uh, gives us the insight that we need to know you and to be saved. I pray that you would help us to grow each day in our relationship with you. We pray, Lord, for, for every person who is gathered here now at this time, that your richest blessings would rest upon them. I pray that you would provide every need that they have. I pray that throughout their lifetime, that you, your spirit would work through them in such a way as to testify the grace of God in their lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.